Welcome. We are about ready to start our final or concluding Bible study on the Gospel of John. We're going to be in chapter 21 today. Uh, there's actually uh, an epilogue here. It's a, a second conclusion. You'll find that the very last verses of chapter 21 align very much with chapter 20 uh, as uh, there's one additional piece of information that uh, the Holy Spirit wanted to give us as he inspired uh, the, the writer here, which was John the Apostle, that uh, Jesus loved and how he identifies himself. Uh, but we're going to go into this study with an open heart. Uh, there are times when I have heard a lot of different preachers talk about this particular chapter. And uh, when they talk about the chapter, they want to focus a lot on the changing word use between when Jesus asks uh, Peter if he loves him using the Greek word agapeo. Uh, and uh, then Peter responds back that I'm very affectionate to you. I, I have a strong leaning towards you and so forth. And they want to really focus in on what Peter is saying. I think we're going to go a different route today because I believe that the highest importance for us is to see what Jesus is saying, not necessarily what Peter is saying. Sometimes our responses don't even line up with what our heart is saying. And so uh, we can't. We have to take that as, as it is. Uh, sometimes we say things and, and it may be worded incorrectly, but uh, the Lord knows our hearts. And so we're going to look at what Jesus is actually saying to Peter in this chapter. And Jesus is an expert at healing up a broken conscience. He's the one who can take care of our past sins. He's the one that has forgiven us, and now he wants us to walk forward. And so this is going to be an interaction with Peter, just along those same lines, as he wants to make sure that Peter is able to move forward, not stopped in the middle of the, the calling that he has, but rather can move forward. So let's go to chapter 21. We're going to read a portion the first opening scene, if you will, while the uh, disciples are out fishing. And then we're going to take a look at the conversation that Jesus has with Peter. And so in chapter 21, it says in verse 1 afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. So in Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, and Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat. But that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called to them, friends, haven't you any fish? They answered, no. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he'd taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire with burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him who you are. They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This is now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. So let's look at what's happening here. So uh, at the very beginning, we have this case where the disciples have gone back home. Uh, remember, they mostly were from Galilee. They've gone back home. And it appears that Peter has this idea in his mind. He says, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go back to my old life. Uh, I failed miserably as a disciple, a called one of Jesus. And so I'm going to go back and I'm going to fish. And um, he calls out to his friends. Uh, and we have the list 
list here of uh, Simon Peter, uh, Thomas, and, and uh, then we also know the sons of Zebedee, that's, that's James and John. And then it mentions two other apostles or disciples were together. Now it's interesting here that John, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, decides to leave out the names of the two other disciples. Um, with a little bit of research, knowing that this is the epilogue and going and seeing what happened at the very beginning, we might be able to figure out who those disciples were. Uh, for after all, uh, when we talk about uh, Thomas, uh, you can't help but mention also Nathaniel uh, because they were linked together at the very beginning, one bringing the other uh, actually into relationship, knowing Jesus as a result of the testimony of the other. And then uh, we have Peter here, uh, and uh, we obviously know that Peter was introduced also to Jesus by Andrew. Uh, so probably the the, the other disciples that are mentioned here without name are, are Andrew and Nathaniel. Uh, although we do not have that for sure, and uh, the Holy Spirit has left that information out. Now, why? It could be, just could be, that God wants us to be in the boat with them, that God wants us to imagine ourselves as the disciples that are there ready to, to, to see all of these things that are happening. But it appears that Simon Peter has decided that he's going to go out and take up his old life. He's going to go fishing. And so he tells them, I'm going to go fishing. Now, remember that when they go fishing here in this particular case, it says, I'm going out to fish. And he told, tells them, and they are all going out as well but on that night they catch nothing so they went out to go fishing and all of these were fishermen before uh, if you go into Luke chapter 5 for example in verse 11 it says they pulled their boat uh, up to the shore they left everything and followed him this was the previous and now here they are back in the boat again Back, instead of going and doing what Jesus had told them to do and be prepared to be the apostles that are going to reach the world, they're back in a small, confined boat. In Matthew chapter 4 and verse 21, it says, Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and the brother John. They were in their boat with their father, Zebedee, praying, uh, repairing their nets. Jesus called to them, and that's when they came. So it could even be that they're out using the boat that still exists. They had James and John's father, Zebedee, alone and was out there and so they took it out for the night to go fishing and see what it is that they may be able to catch. So they go out and they spend all night and they catch nothing. I don't think it is by chance. I've gone out fishing before and I've had many times this experience not catching anything and I think that it's because in this particular case Jesus wanted to make sure that they understood they were not supposed to be fishermen anymore. There are certain things that we like to do, perhaps, and certain certain things that was the family business, but that doesn't mean that that's God's calling on us. And you may even be uh, successful at it. In the case of Peter, in the case of, of uh, James and John, in the case of, of these fishermen, they had been good at it. And here, all night long after having this, this time of three years following Jesus and hearing everything, they simply catch nothing. The Lord is making sure that Peter does not get encouraged to go back into the fishing business. After all, Peter has decided that he's a failed disciple. He's probably looking for, looking for a new job. And uh, so in verse 4, it says, Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, and the disciples were not able to recognize him. Now, that's easy to understand. They're a hundred, he's a hundred yards away. That's a full football field away. And you can see that somebody is there, and they may even be able to shout with the use of the water as an echo device to be able to understand what's being said and so forth. Uh, but they're, they're out there fishing, and Jesus is on shore. What a difference. Because before they left everything, they left left the boat, they left the nets to follow Jesus. And now Jesus is alone on shore. And so he calls to them. And the word that he uses there, and in the way that it's translated, he says friends, is really a diminutive term. It means little children, uh, little ones, uh, you, you, people who, who have lost their way, perhaps. Uh, people who don't understand all of the details of the life around them. Uh, infants, if you will, but, uh, but uh, able to go out and play. They're out there playing on the water. And so Jesus calls him out, calls out and says, don't you have any fish? Well, he knew that they didn't have fish, but he's just emphasizing the fact that they are miserable failures at this. And he doesn't want them to get the idea that they could be good fishermen. 
So then he's going to give them a blessing. He's going to go ahead and tell them that uh, they could cast their nets on the other side. He says in verse 6, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. And so they do. And this had to have brought back memories of the very first time that they were called when Jesus had borrowed Peter's boat, if you will, had gone out into the water. And uh, let, let me read it for you in Luke chapter 5, verses 1 and following. One day as Jesus was standing uh, by the lake of Gesenaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets he got into one of the boats the one belonging to Simon and asked him to put out a little from shore then he sat down and taught the people from the boat when he had finished speaking he said to Simon put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. Remember, the, he, he's trying to remind them of their past. All of this first session is to remind Peter of who he was, the things that he has done, and where he is supposed to go now. And so he says, but, when, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. We're still in that first calling. In verse 6 of that same Luke chapter, it says, When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both uh, boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you will fish for people. So he pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. And now you realize here that Jesus is talking. And so when he says, cast your nets on the other side, immediately on in verse 7, the disciple whom Jesus uh, loved says to Peter, when they cast the nets over the other side, there's this flashback. And they say, you know what, there's no way this is just a coincidence. This is exactly like the time when we were called with only one difference. We'll get back to that difference in just a moment. But John immediately recognizes, although he may not be able to see Jesus, he couldn't understand or discern from the voice who that might be. But he was able to know, based on the fact that all of these fish are here, that they were seeing and hearing from Jesus and so they bring the, the boat closer in. But I want you to notice something in the text that we read there in Luke. What we find is that when they catch all of these fish, the nets begin to break. It's going to be important. So in verse 9, it says, When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals with, a, with fish on it and some bread. Interesting points. First of all, Jesus didn't eat the fish they had just caught. He already had fish on the shore. Second point, it says that there was a fire of burning coals. Now, this is only, the only other time, other than at the time when Peter denies Jesus three times, do we have this Greek term for a coal fire. Other times we have a fire that has uh, wood thrown on it or so forth, but this is the only time specifically it mentions a coal fire using the term. And it may be, and I believe, that Jesus is provoking. So what is he doing? Jesus stands on the shore and he says, let me remind you of who you were. You were fishermen. I told you, you're not going to be fishermen anymore. I told you that you are going to be fishers of men, Jesus says. And so when the disciples come in, they're thinking about this. They're saying, you know what, Jesus has given us a call. But there's one of the disciples that has denied Jesus. And he was the one who suggested to go out fishing. And Jesus is going to confront him. And here the Lord takes Peter around a coal fire. Now, was he doing this intentionally? I think so. Because the last time Peter had been warming himself around the coal fire was the time that he had denied Christ. And he walks in and he sees the group gathered around a coal fire. And he had to have flashbacks. 
And he says, I know where this is going because Jesus is dealing with this. And so, so Jesus says to Simon Peter that he needs to bring some fish in verse 10. So Simon Peter climbs back into the boat and he drags the net ashore. It says it was full of fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. 153, what an interesting number, just enough to be divided evenly amongst the disciples. Now, it wasn't so that they could go out and make a good living. Jesus had already said, you're not going to be the, the, the fisherman. Now, there's times when we need to learn that, that lesson. I remember as a child or as a teen or more, uh, my father would say, you know what? I know that you're called to go into the ministry, but you know, there's a lot of people that, that end up having problems or, or it fails in the future. It's nice to have something to fall back on. And my father, being a mechanic, had me come to his business. I had to learn certain lessons and certain, uh, certain ways of working on cars. To this day, it really is beneficial uh, because I can help out other people in, in their times of need and so forth. Uh, but I, I've never wanted to go back. And uh, there was a time in my life when, when things were, were struggling and I went into uh, a business situation working at a, a dealership, a car dealership, as a service writer in their, in their service department because I understood the way cars worked and so forth. And I'll tell you, it was the most miserable time of my life uh, as I knew in my heart the call that God had placed on me and that I was supposed to do something different. Not that being a mechanic, service writer, or any other business is not correct. But when God has called you to do something else, you simply can't be content in it. And so Peter has come and he pulls this net ashore. And it says that with so many, the net was not torn. Now, the first occasion, it says the net was torn. This occasion, it says the net was not torn. Now, why the difference? In the first occasion, Jesus is telling his disciples, you are not to be fishers anymore. You're going to be fishers of men. And as a result, this is torn. We have the same situation take place. We're not to have this separation of the Holy of Holies because the veil was torn at the time when Jesus was crucified and died. And we're not supposed to mend that, that uh, veil back together. You and I have access into the presence of God. The same thing, when Jesus allowed that first net to be torn, he was saying, don't go back to the fishing. But in this particular case, it's saying he's saying, look, the net is not torn because I called you to do something else. I tore the net for being a fisherman of fish, and I told you you're going to be fishers of men. That net still remains intact. As Peter pulls it up, even with so many fish, that's what it says, the surprise, even with so many fish, the net was not torn. Jesus is communicating to Peter that he still has a calling to be able to fish for men in this particular case. And so in verse 12 says, Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, what it looks like is that Jesus is still separated. There's a distance, if you will, between Jesus and the disciples. He has separated himself from the coal fire where all of the disciples gather around. They see the fish, they see the bread. And so still from the distance, they're not able to make out exactly who it is. But that's what it, why it says, Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? Because he was still a distance away. They knew it was the Lord, even though they couldn't identify his features based on seeing him. So then in verse 13, this is when we have the case where, where uh, Jesus comes, says Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them. Now, when, when we have Jesus not being recognized, that happens. That happens in, in, in John chapter 1, in verse 35 to 39. The next day, John was there again with two disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, 
He said, look, the Lamb of God. Now, we know who Jesus is based on who he is, not on based on what he looks like. Uh, trying to go to the uh, Shroud of Turin, uh, trying to figure out the exact way, facial features that Jesus had while he walks on earth, that's not the important thing. The fact of the matter is here that for a long time, the disciples had walked with Jesus. They had seen different people walking with Jesus, but now instead of seeing his humanity in the forefront, seeing his deity in the forefront. But Jesus says, come. He wants them to come and be with them. And this is what Jesus actually did. And that first day when Jesus saw the disciples, uh, John uh, says, this is the Lamb of God. And so when when they, they ask, Rabbi, in verse 20, uh, 38, says, Rabbi, where are you staying? We studied this back when we were in that first chapter. And Jesus says, come. And so he simply says, come and be with me. Come over here. You know, this is an important word throughout all of the Gospels. The word come, when God calls us, we are supposed to come. In Genesis chapter 7, we have in verse 1, our English translation actually does this misservice. Uh, it, it says, the Lord then said to Noah, go into the ark. But if you study the Hebrew in this particular case, what you're going to see is that it says, the Lord said to Noah, come into the ark. As though God were inviting Noah to be in the safety of the ark with him. Now, the same thing, the last chapter of Revelation, we have this word spoken over and over again. If I read for you chapter 22, Revelation, and verse 17, it says, the spirit and the bride say, come, and, and let the one who hears say, come, let the one who is thirsty come, and let the one who wishes take the free gift of water of life. And so Jesus is saying to his disciples, come, I am the one that's providing. I am the one that's taking care of you. You did not need to be out in the boat fishing all night. Sure, you have 153 fish now, but come, I'm going to take care of you. So then it says, as I already mentioned in verse 13, then Jesus came and took bread and gave it to them. It was, as Jesus had been at a distance, and now all of a sudden he moves closer to them, they're able to make out his features. But again, it's not about his humanity. It's about his deity. And it says, it says here in this portion of, of our text that Jesus is setting up the, the parameters, if you will. All of this happened as, and it could be like, you know, so uh, common. The, the disciples are out fishing, and this is something that a lot of people did. And he, all of a sudden, the, the common is changed around. Jesus takes a boat with fishermen that catch nothing and fills the net with 153 fish. He tells his disciples, come, I don't need your fish. I have the sufficient. He puts them around the coal fire to be able to deal with Peter. Now, one of the most important things that we understand about Jesus is he knows how to heal a broken conscience. Now, sometimes we think that if a person feels guilty, we should just not mention it. But that's not Jesus' take. Jesus says, I have to take you right there so that we could deal with this and move on. And so let's read on in verse 15. And it says, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord. He said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself. And when you were, and you went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw that, saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following him. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper. And he had said, Lord, who is going to, who is going to betray you? 
When Peter saw him, he asked the Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, the rumor spread among the believers that this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, that is what, uh, what is that to you? This is a disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. And so let's let's take a look at what Jesus does for Peter in this particular case. Because Jesus is taking some ordinary situations to be able to bring restoration. Now it's important that we have restoration. We cannot minister freely in the future if we do not have a clean conscience. Paul also talks about the fact that our conscience is sprinkled with the blood of Jesus and that we can walk in that holiness before him. But what it says here in verse 15, it says, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, now, first of all, at the very beginning, we need to realize the impact that this would have made. Before we get to even the question that Jesus says, do you love me? Jesus here says, Simon, son of John. Now, why is that important? Because Jesus is taking him back. Jesus goes back to his original name. If you remember, for example, in, in John chapter 1 and verse 42, it says, and he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John, but you will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. And then we also have in, in Matthew 16, verse 17, Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Now, so what is Jesus doing here? Jesus says, look, I haven't called you anything but Peter for years. And here you are in front of me, and I'm going to call you something. And Listen to what I'm saying. Simon, son of John. Because all of a sudden, Peter wasn't considering himself Peter. He wasn't the rock. He wasn't the one with the call. He was ready to abandon. He was ready to go fishing. Peter had forgotten what God had done in his life. And so Jesus says, fine, if that's the way you're going to act, I'm going to treat you like this, and I'm going to call you, and I'm going to have to start from the beginning with you, and I'm going to remind you of certain details. Remember, at the beginning, you were called Simon, son of John, and so I will call you Simon, son of John. And so what he says later on, he brings him back through the future, and he says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Now, what is he saying? When Jesus says, do you love me more than these? He could be talking and looking at 153 fish and say, Simon, do you love me more than fishing? You went fishing when I told you you weren't going to be a fisherman anymore. Simon, son of John, are you wanting me to be Simon, son of John, or are you wanting to be Peter? Do you love me more than fishing? Well, that's a possibility. I've heard people talk about it. I don't really share with that. that. I think that Jesus is comparing Simon with the other disciples. The other disciples are gathered around that same fire, that same coals, those same coals burning, and he looks at Simon Peter, and he says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Now, why? Because Simon Peter had said he did. Back in Matthew chapter 26, when Jesus tells the disciples that they would all fall away, Simon Peter, it says in verse 33, Peter replied, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. I love you more than all of the disciples. Truly I tell you, Jesus answered, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. So Peter set himself up as the 
disciple who loved Jesus more. Now, John may have been the disciple that Jesus loved the most. We don't know. That's how he labels himself. But we are here being told that Peter considered himself to be, of all the disciples, the one that loved Jesus the most. And then when he went into that courtyard of the high priest and he denied Jesus, his whole life came crumbling around around him. And so he says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And Simon would have been taken back, Peter would have been taken back to that moment of the crucifixion, that moment of the Last Supper, when Jesus had told him, and the moments of awe, and there he is standing around a coal fire, and he had said, Jesus, I love you more than all of these, and now Jesus comes back and confronts him and says, do you really love me more than everybody? We all know what happened. And so Jesus says this to him, and his response is, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. I understand the word in Greek changes here. I'm not going to focus our attention on that at this moment. But Jesus here simply says to him in response, we want to look at Jesus' response. He says, feed my lambs. Now, this is important because the Lord accepts Peter's word at face value. He says, you love me? Great. I want you to do something. You need to change from your secular work You're not going to be a fisherman any longer, and I want you to feed my lambs. I want you to understand that the youngest ones need to have accurate food, all right? And so then again in verse 16, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And so what's Jesus' response? He doesn't say the same thing. The response of Jesus is, take care of my sheep. Now, all of a sudden, he has changed. The first word there for feed, for the lambs, is completely different. This is the word that that looks like the the idea of providing the right food for these the youngest ones. Uh, you could imagine on a farm going out with the with the nursing bottle for those lambs who had lost their parents, and and it was the surrogate mother, if you will. I remember as a young boy, I we had uh, horses, and uh, the in one particular case, uh, the whole mother horse was pregnant. She died giving birth uh, in the process, and we had to feed with this large milk bottle the the new foal, the new baby horse. And uh, so he comes before Simon Peter in the first part, and he says, look, I need you to be the surrogate mother. I need you to feed the lambs. But then he says in the second time, do you love me? Oh, if you love me, then I want you to take care of of my sheep. You see, the lambs need to be fed and the sheep need to be guided. The sheep need to be guided. This is what Jesus is saying. So here he comes again and he says in verse, seven, verse 16, all right, take it back. In verse 17, the Lord, the third time he said to him, or Jesus says to him, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? It says Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? I think Jesus is provoking him because he denied Jesus three times. And you know, it's very similar to the fact that, that Peter uh, uh, starts, to, starts to get angry because that's exactly what happened the first time when he denied Christ uh, by the, by, for the girl that is at the door. He just simply brushed it off and said, no, I don't know him. He goes in, somebody yells, confronts him, and he says, no, I don't know him. The third time somebody comes and asks him, accuses him of also being a disciple, I'll read for you in Matthew 26 and verse 73 and 74. It says, after a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. Then he began to call down curses, and he swore to them he did not know the man. The third time, Peter's anger came up and his emotions spewed out and all of these, his past life 
came out. He began to curse rather than bless. He began to attack rather than, than, than comfort. And so Jesus asked him again, and in this case, again, Peter is hurt, and he allows that emotion to come up, and he says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus again comes back in with another distinct statement. He says, feed my sheep. You see how Jesus has moved. He's given a threefold commissioning. Now, Peter has heard the same question over and over again, but he should have been hearing the response of Jesus because Jesus is explaining the type of ministry that Peter is going to have. He is calling Peter to be a pastor. He says, look, Peter, the newest ones, the youngest ones, those are the ones that we have to be the most cautious with because we have to feed them. The lambs feed my lambs. And then you're going to have to make sure that you are a good shepherd, leading my sheep to the right pastures and helping them. And then when they get there, my sheep, the grown ones also, have to be nurtured, have to grow. I know for a lot of years as a pastor, people come to me and they ask, well, well how do you prepare and design Bible studies and sermons and so forth. And um, uh, there are churches that cater primarily to the infants, the newest in Christ. You'll find churches that grow and they have these new people in Christ, but they have a constant turnover because the pastor's ministry is always to feed the lambs, to, to, to bring in evangelism, if you will. And then there's people who have this ministry of guiding and leading to the right pastures. And, and uh, they come to me and they say, you know, and I say, look, what I need to do is make sure I provide the adequate food so that the uh, to adult, the mature in Christ, will be nourished, be challenged, so that they will have strength to be able to go and be and follow a leader that is out in front of them. And then they will be able to also feed the infants. You know, the youngest in Christ think they understand everything that's being shared in a sermon or in a Bible study. But I'll be honest with you, sometimes the theologies, the things that I mention are really for the deep, really for those people who have a strong foundation in Christ. And so it's fun because everybody goes away with something. They've been nourished by the milk in some cases and some by the meat. Paul also mentions this, uh, that we should be people who are longing for that solid food. Uh, and, and this is who we are. And so Jesus is commissioning Peter to do the work of a pastor. He says in verse 18 then, and if you look at, at, at the work of Peter, if you look through the Gospels, uh, or not the Gospels, the, the, the epistles that Peter wrote, he has a very pastoral heart. If you look at the opening verses and chapters of the book of Acts, Peter's the one that gets up to feed the lambs. Peter's the one that gives some guidelines as he brings the gospel message for the first time into the Gentile's life when he ministers to Cornelius and his family in chapter 10. He is the one who's, who's able to give this, the, the milk to the babies. He's the one that guides into new ideas, the church, if you will, and he's the one that's providing the solid food for the mature. And so Jesus commissions him and we can look now at the life of Peter and say, you know what? It worked. Jesus didn't leave Peter with his broken conscience out there fishing. He calls him to come in and do something completely different than he thought he was going to do. He was going to be again the rock that was going to have the pastoral ministry to feed the lambs, guide the sheep, and then feed the sheep as well. If we move on into verse 18, Jesus says to him, Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself. And you went where you wanted, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. And so here at this time, when remember when John is writing this gospel, he is the last one alive. He, this is one of the last of the New Testament books to have been written. And so John 
already realizes that Peter has fulfilled this calling. That John, looking back and saying, you know what, what Jesus said, wow, I remember when Peter did this and when Peter did that. And he could remember those moments. He remembers the moment in which Peter was martyred for God. All of these things had taken place. Peter had lived all the rest of his life under the shadow of the cross. And the Lord had promised to Peter that he would glorify him in his death. He may have had this failure before, but he says, look, Peter, this is when you were Simon, son of John. Now you are again instituted as Peter. I am giving you this commission. You are going to pastor my, my church. You're going to be the one who's going to give nutrition to the smallest ones, guide the more mature, and feed the, the, the strong in me. You're going to be able to supply all all of these. And don't worry, Peter, you're never going to fail again because I'm going to make you solid. You are going to be that rock and you are going to glorify me in your death. And we know that to be the case. John is writing this as a statement in the future made by Peter, by Jesus about Peter. But John is also there as a testament, as a witness to the fact that he, in fact, had fulfilled exactly what his calling was. And so Peter then turning around and he, and he says, uh, uh, well, let's read verse 19. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Here's the thing. We are called to glorify God, whatever our calling. That's the end play. That we do what we do, not for others. Peter, you're not going to be feeding the lambs because the lambs need to be fed. You're going to be feeding my lambs, it's for me. You're not going to be feed, leading some sheep. You're going to be leading my sheep. You're not going to be feeding some sheep. You're going to be leading my sheep. And I'm saying this because you're going to glorify. And, and this is what it is. So follow me. So there may have been some sort of a competition, if you will, in the minds of uh, the disciples. And, and I don't know all of the, that played out. So Peter then all of a sudden turns around and says, you know what? I love you more. I've said that. But you constantly have this special relationship. He even libels himself, uh, this guy, John, as the disciple that you love. So what's going to happen to him? So what's going to happen to him? And so the Lord says to him, Lord, Peter, Charlie, let's read that in verse 20. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This is the one who had leaned against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Now listen again to what Jesus says. Jesus says, basically, that's none of your business, Peter. I'm calling you, I'm talking to you about what your call is that you need to do. And so Peter, don't worry about this. But notice what happens. It says in verse 23, because of this, the rumor spread among the believers that this disciple would not die. Now, granted, that rumor was probably very much enrooted and, and strengthened when some uh, attempted to kill John and he hadn't been killed. Well, I believe that's because Jesus had not finished the work that John wanted to was supposed to do. This gospel hadn't even been written yet. John hadn't been on the Isle of Patmos. And so he has to write about the revelation. Our calling is a great source of security even in this life. I often have told my family, my friends, that while I am still, I still have something to do on this earth, I'm gonna continue on. It doesn't matter how dangerous the situation is. Paul says the same thing. You know, I would love to be with the Lord, he says, but I'm convinced that it's, my, it's more prudent, uh, prudent it's more uh, uh, to your benefit that I remain, so I'll probably remain because God's call on me has yet to be finished. Jesus himself didn't die until on the cross he had fulfilled everything, and he said, 
it is finished. So when God's work for us is done, that's when it's done. John, in fact, did die. There was a doctrine that started to float around that, that, that when John died, he really didn't die. He's in the grave walking around uh, in his tomb, walking around and so forth, because after all, he's not going to die. But let me emphasize the fact that Jesus did not say that John would not die. He was focused on Peter, saying, Peter, that's none of your concern. Don't worry about my other disciples. They all have their unique callings. They all have their unique position in me, just as we still do today. The things that I do is going to be different than the things that you're going to do. But God has called us all to do things, and we continue on with that taking place. But what it says is that all of a sudden, because Jesus makes this statement, the disciples have this rumor that goes around. It says in verse 23, because of this, the rumor spread among the believers that this disciple would not die. But what do we have about rumors? Rumors are not necessarily true. Matter of fact, the vast majority of rumors are not. We have in Matthew chapter 24, verse 4 and to 6, it says, Jesus answered, Watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah, and I will, de and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. In other words, what Jesus says is don't be concerned about the rumors because your commissioning is still there. You are calling. The gifts and calling of the Lord are without repentance. We are steadfast in the things that God is calling us to do, in who God is calling us to be. So let's not get wrapped up in all of the rumors that are floating around us. Let Jesus be our healer. Let Jesus come and say, I know that you failed in this. There has never been a time when forgiveness is granted without confessing the sin. We come before Jesus and we have to go back and relive those failed moments as Peter did. He had to relive that as he was invited to come and, and remember that he was not Simon, son of John anymore. That he was put around the coal fire to remind himself of the time that he was heaving his hand, warming his hands, and he was there denying Jesus just after he had said that he loved Jesus more than any of them. And so Jesus confronts him on those points. And then he says, look, all of that is not the point. If you want, I can call you. So do you love me? Yes, I love you. Well, that's what it takes. So feed my lambs. Do you love me? Yes, I love you, Jesus. So that's what it takes. Guide my sheep. Do you love me, Peter? Yes, I love you, Jesus. So feed my sheep as well. And so God gives that calling, that steadfastness, that, that, that Peter-like attitude once again. And Peter takes that moment and moves forward for the rest of his life following Jesus with all of his heart, with all of his mind. The question for us today is, have you gone too far? Well, if you think, Peter had considered himself to have gone too far. He went out and said, I'm just going to fish. I don't, I don't qualify. If you think about Paul, the apostle, who at one moment was also called Saul. He had persecuted, attacked, and killed off Christians. And he thought, I am the worst of sinners. But what happens? God calls him. Our past, we can simply walk away from it. When we simply come before Jesus and say, Jesus, I love you with all of my heart. I am ready to serve you with all that I am. Forgive me for my past failures and allow me to walk in holiness before you. That is when we have a door thrown open in front of us and God can use us in the way that he has decided 
to use us. Now, your calling may be one day and you pass away tomorrow, but make sure that you do all that you need to do in that day. Your calling may last you 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, even 100 years. It doesn't matter how long it takes for you to fulfill all the things that God has called us to do as we walk in obedience. Now, if you turn away and walk away, that doesn't mean that all of a sudden you can have eternal life walking on earth. But while we're still walking in the calling as God has more plans, more things assigned to us, we can have confidence that we're going to be able to live those moments out and we're going to be able to preach his word to those people. So go out having been forgiven, having the past remain in the past and the future a new thing. Because what does Jesus do for us? He says that he has made all things new, that we are a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all, all things have become new. So walk in that newness, that newness that Peter celebrated, that newness that gave Peter courage to stand up on the day of Pentecost and preach, the newness that gave Peter to obey Jesus and go into a Gentile's house when he knew it would cause people problems all around. We are not here to please people. We are here to please Jesus. And so we are feeding his lambs, guiding his sheep and feeding his sheep. That is our calling, and that's what we are to do on an ongoing basis. Well, we come to the end of our study on the Gospel of John. Pray that you have been blessed, that you've enjoyed it, that you've grown, that you know Jesus in a better way, and that you're willing to hear his voice rather than the voice of others. That we listen to, P the, to Peter and what he says, but we hear with open heart what Jesus says, because he is the one, the only one that has the words of eternal life. Now, next week, we're going to be back together again, starting a new Bible study. We're going to be in the Old Testament book, The Prophet of Jeremiah. It's going to be an exciting study. I want to encourage you to be with us throughout the entire time of that study, and we are going to grow together. God bless you. Have a blessed and wonderful week.